Yo, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for tuning into this episode. This is going to be the last interview for a while. Um, We're making a shift in the brand. And so my new co-host is going to be Michael McAvoy. Brilliant kid. Good friend of mine. I trust him with my life. And he's a special person. And so our conversations are going to be good. Um, The next five months, we're going to experiment with some content. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if I'm really built for this or not. (laughs) And so (laughs) it'll be interesting regardless of the outcome. So thank you for tuning in. This episode, Professor Ty Monroe, I interviewed him in December. So in 2023, I interviewed him. If you listen to the episode all the way through, you'd notice that there's like a 10 to 15 minute block where I ask him specific questions about the final because I was taking his class at the time. So those questions don't make sense, to be honest. I mean, they make make sense to me and to him at the time because I was asking him class specific questions. But looking back, that wasn't the best for the interview, but I really needed that help. So Professor Monroe's great. He's a great guy. He's a father. He's a theologian, and he's a Celtics fan, most importantly, of course. <laughs> Enjoy the episode. I'm going to be posting clips and some other content on Instagram. Tune into that. And thank you. Let's go. It's, so it seems like uh, there's probably too many of us that are a little bit delinquent, which I've been in the past, that if they put it at four, if you're late, you're really late. But right. if they put it at noontime, so... What is your method for reading essays? Like, do you read it once? Do you read it twice? Um, I do. I have too many. I'll just be honest and say I have too many students to read it twice. I mean, once in a while, I I might read one and go, I'm not really sure I got the right. I have a thought on what the grade should be, and then I second guess and go, let me just quickly read through that again. But that's pretty rare. Okay. I mean, I I think if students... um, knew how long even the most committed professors spend reading a paper they'd be a little scandalized mm. but that's also because it's not, it's not because we're we're um taking our job lightly i, I shouldn't speak for other people i say for me um i, I can read really fast okay, yeah. <laughs> right i mean i have to sit down and read and you've read many of these i've read many so of them i know papers. what sort of things to look right. for um uh, I can pick up grammatical and stylistic issues very quickly and the conceptual stuff i should have mastery of it right mm. So if I can read Augustine and Aquinas and maybe even on a good day Hegel or Kierkegaard or something like that um, with some comprehension, then I should be able to read through a student paper thoroughly, right? Yeah. I don't, I'm not skimming it, right? But really, really read it thoroughly in, in short order. Very nice. But I will say this. When you start grading at your beginning of your teaching career, you definitely do t- – it does take you longer. It does take you longer. So okay, um, cool. that's not a commitment thing. When I say – I tend to read through papers a lot quick, more quickly than students would realize. It's not because I'm not genuinely reading them. Right. It just it doesn't take me that long. Your grading system is a traditional style grading system, I'd say, for the most part. Um, yeah, with, with the rubric. With the no, yeah. yeah. I, I was saying, I was thinking about Professor McGrath's, Professor Stoner's okay, methods yep. now of these specs grading systems. Yeah, yes, where yes, you can like more select. More innovative, yeah. You you could get an A in a class and maybe not take the final. That's actually how Professor mm. McGrath's class works. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Would you ever consider moving over to that kind of grading system? I, I would. I would. I haven't. I just right now at this point in my teaching career, I haven't had the um, I haven't taken the time or had the time to sort of study some of those those more non-traditional forms of grading, spend time thinking about them and then spend time thinking about and actually applying how they would work in my classes. So mm. it, because I know it's something that's going to I'm going to have to say, OK, do I really want to do this or do I really want to you know, test run this? Um, and what would it look like? Which class would I do? And I haven't had the time or made the time okay, to do right. that. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I'll be honest and say I'm. I'm not. I'm not unsatisfied with my more traditional grading up to this point. I may get there, and I may, I may be be convinced by more um, capable, more pedagogically capable colleagues that I should. But at this point, I, it seems to work right, well right. for me. I don't know. Yeah. You, you, you've you've gotten feedback from me. No, I think that. I like your grading system. There aren't many assignments, so you, or I guess there not are in the upper level. Yeah, right. there's a lot more in my 100 class. Right, because because they're reading responses or responses. Right, those are the week. low stakes, though, right? Right. And I do grade those, but I don't give feedback on them because they're every week. Sure, but but the freshman get them or the lower level gets them twice a week, right? They have to do. No, those. if it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, they're writing three oh, times. Oh, three times. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I graded. I did 500 did words. The, the uh, 250, 250, okay, okay. but three times. So I think I graded, I read, and you talk about re- re- really reading, yeah. not just glancing at it and saying that's an 88 or that's a 72. <laughs> really reading it, I think I read a, about a thousand discussion board posts this semester just across two first year classes, two 100 level classes. Wow. So that's insane. <laughs> that's why I'm, 
I've been really uh, between that and chair duties. Uh, it's been a busy. So you me. have practice, like you can do this quickly, is, I can, which makes sense, I right? Can. Right. But I, the reason I do that, Gabe, is one of the reasons I do it is when I'm on top of it, when I'm not behind, it it adds to my ability. I think in and we didn't, you didn't see this as much in your upper level class, mid level class, because number one, we only had weekly ones, and number two, we only met two two days a week, and number three, we actually already had a good dynamic where I didn't. I didn't have to sort of most most weeks. I think I didn't have to sort of prompt you guys to be invested in the question, to see the stakes of the question, to see mm. what's at stake in the text. But with a first year class where they don't have that same um, facility and practice with number one reading difficult primary texts and number two talking about them right in front of students they don't really in front know, of people they don't write just got to college yeah. coming out of high school where participation is a very different thing in that context. If I can take 20, 30 minutes um, or a little bit more bef- right before class, because it's their due right before class, and read all 22 of their things, and I did this quite a bit, mm. um, okay. I could say, hey, uh, Megan, or hey, you know, Braden, or whatever, right. um, you, you said this about Augustine's conf-, And they're like, you read that? Like, yeah, <laughs> that's mm. why you did. And then we can sort of have a, and that, that was really invaluable. Um, I started doing those weekly and daily reading response things probably three or four years ago. I went back and forth between doing them online and, and in physical journals, but I, I it's hard for me to to not do them now because they really that's a it's very time intensive, but it really does add I think hmm. to their learning experience. At least they tell me they students in the one hundred. I say we hated doing those, but we're glad we did them. Right. And then when I have a, a, a 200 level that was linked, sometimes I'll have students say, you know what? We hated those back in the fall. And the same group of students will say, now you're only doing them once a week and we're, we're, we can see that we're, we're, sla- you know, we're not doing the reading. I'm like, well, it's on mm. you now. I can't hold your hand right, right, right. the whole way through. I did hold your hand a little bit by forcing you to do that um, every day we met, but now it's weekly. So anyway. No, that's a good – I think it's good you brought up your class. I want to touch on the class I took. So oh. I took Revelation Ancient and Modern. Yep. Um, uh, but one thing about readings and assignments is it, there is a different pressure when you have to do an assignment for the reading. Versus you have to you respond, don't. yeah. So it's so that student raises a good point. Um, I struggle with that at times this semester for sure. Um, but as far as your class goes, mm. I took Revelation, Ancient and Modern, one fifty, one fifty three for okay, yeah. this semester, and now starting in the spring, it's going to be two fifty three. Two fifty three. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, and you would take time at the beginning of every class to kind of just talk to the students. Mm. I think it was a ask people for announcements right yeah, yeah why do you do that i mean i enjoyed it but why, why do i do it yeah why do you take time to do that uh so yeah it's a great question um learning for me has has always been thinking and learning for me has always been a communal enterprise um and that's a, that's a fancy way i think of saying it's it's a thing you do with and among friends um uh, and we could talk maybe at some point about the you know aristotelian friendships right the, the three forms of it but at the very least knowing um, the individuals that you're teaching and learning with and alongside and from, um, knowing them as human persons, I think is, is super important. And, and also thinking about what we're doing in the context of a community. I mean, that, that's why I try to sort of pitch it as, what are the announcements going on around campus? It tells me about what you're interested in, what you're involved in, CAB, PAWS, athletics, Republican you know, uh, club, whatever it is. But it also tells me about and tells each other what's going on right. on campus. I mean, I always tell the first years, and I think I've said it to some of people in your class and your cohort, cohort. Before the pandemic here at Assumption, you would hear people say, this place is boring, there's nothing to do. And I would just roast students for this. Roast Before them. the pandemic, yeah. Oh, I would roast them and say, sure. you're crazy. There's so much going on on this campus. You just need to tap into it. Now, after the pandemic, especially right after, there really was a, a dearth. There really was a, a lack of things to do. It's not that way anymore. It's not quite, it's getting back to that level. But... It's only going to get back to the level where it needs to be, where people are, you know, having everything from very simple social, you know, craft events and, and mm-hmm. drop in things to really serious lectures and things like that and, and panel discussions. Um, if students know about it and are engaged in it and, and there is a, sometimes a, a lack of awareness of what's going on. So when right, students right. say, hey, we're doing this and that, that I think fosters an overall sense of community. And so in addition to sort of just breaking the ice at the beginning of right. uh, what I, what I think it does to us all, not just to the students, but for me, is it's like an implicit way of saying, this is a th- this is a community of friends, and we care about each other's lives and what's going on in this context. So whatever we're going to say about these difficult texts or these difficult questions or these speculative theological issues, that they're all they're all being discussed within the context of, you know, 
Right, you help them remember it's bigger than just theology class. Like it we're is. here to be friends. It and, is. And yeah. I think that's great. I mean, um, Madeline would always tell us what's going on. Like, yeah, we'd have a few people events, who were very right? plugged then, in. Yeah. Yeah, we rely on them. Yeah, and yeah. that was cool. Like, yeah. I, I wouldn't have known about the Boston thing unless mm-hmm. she said it. Yeah. I didn't go, but I'm sure it was ah, great. Ah, ah, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, good. It's good. That is an interesting topic of discussion, though, that the campus has you know, slowed down during COVID and there was not many things to do. Yeah. Now it seems like we're closer to that time before yeah, COVID, right? I think so. Um, but it raises the question, are students still acting almost as though there aren't many things to do or like, are they yeah. kind of clouded from that COVID era where yeah. we don't really want to do out of, get, get out of our comfort zone and right, do different things right. around campus. Yeah, no, I, I think that we're still struggling with that. And I think that has to do maybe with the fact that um, those of you who are here on campus, you know, you didn't, um, you were somewhere, whether you were, you know, the seniors were, I think math's right. Seniors were, were sophomores, freshmen when it started and kind of through the middle of it. Those who are not that old were in high school when it happened. Mm-hmm. You know, the real thick of it when we were right. sort of on lockdown. So everyone has, in some sense, a formative period in their in their social and intellectual and personal development, namely from, what, you know, 16 to whatever, right. 17 to 22, um, where, yeah, there was a lack of, that, that, that's a time when you kind of figure out how to be. Right. Right? Um, when, Especially when you're 17 or 18. Yeah, or even 16, 16, right? 16, you're, yeah, you're starting right. to hang. You're not doing as, as, as um, you know, in my house, I'll say, oh, you know, my older children, oh, you're going to go on a play date. Because, you know, when they're little, yeah, when right. I was a parent of, well, I'm still a parent of little kids. But it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you're setting up a play date, right? So I <clears> joke and say, <throat> you're not having play dates anymore that, that, that your parents set up for you. You're going, you're, you're, ma- you're joining clubs at high school and you're yeah. saying, I'm going to go out with so-and-so or, or parents saying you're not going to go out with so-and-so, yeah, but, right. but you're learning how to be a social animal, right? Sure, uh, sure. Uh, um, and so the developmental, you know, pause or, or slowdown or attrition that happened, that's a big thing, right? Because there are some people, I think on campus who they're not trying to be antisocial, but they might feel just more comfortable just sitting at, in their room and being on their phone or playing video games or, or, or even just studying, right? Sure. So I always, I, I try to roast my students like, you guys, don't be boring. Get out. Do stuff. Right. Go to a lecture. Go to a pause thing. Go to cab. Go to allies. Go to, be involved. Be, meet other people. Be invested in something. Sure. Yeah. There are so many options. I think that, um, yeah, I'm not really as involved as I could be as well, so. Yeah, it's I'll, hard. I'll look into some The things, demands but, yeah. are there, right? The demands I mean, even there. just doing club basketball this semester. Yeah. How's that? Like, How has that changed you in terms of not just that, you know, physically and all that, but like how, how is that? Put that in the broader context no, of your experience as a student. Great, you think? great question. So as far as the act of the sport goes, I used to I play basketball for many years, mm-hmm. I guess. Well, I started when I was in sixth, fifth grade, which is kind of late. Um, but I loved basketball. I made every team I tried out for and it. I, it was great. Mm. Um, made a ton of friends from basketball. And when I was younger, and less mature, I would get more upset on the basketball court mm-hmm. than you know anywhere else. Right? Yeah. And, the, and it's natural. It's very competitive. I want to win. Yep. I didn't play well. I was upset when someone on the court upset me. I was upset. And very like by the end of my career, as I as I started to care a little bit less almost about the sport, but I still cared about it in a special way. I just realized getting upset and getting angry was honestly embarrassing at times. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. the, you don't want to be like that. Been there. I yep. watch you know NBA players get upset. And I'm like I don't want to do that. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy. Stop asking for the foul. Right. Right. Stop asking yeah, for the yeah, call. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just go back. Like Kawhi, <coughs> Kawhi Leonard Play just the game. goes back. Play you know the game. What I mean? So. Um, well, I was out of practice at being calm in in games and stuff. So, returning to basketball, I found myself like really into it again. Yeah. And um, not really, not I'm not as immature as I was, but sometimes I can't help but just like talk shit. I just can't help it. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Um, so some of my it teammates. It just comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it I think it's happened to me even when I, I haven't played pickup since last year. But yeah. I. I I mean, I it brings out something in you. I'm super right. competitive. I'm yeah. not as good a ball player as you, but I'm super competitive. And I remember sure. like leaving the gym, like going and take a shower, and be like, I can't believe I let that one. Go. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, right. like nobody yeah. has heard me in there. Yeah. Like, yeah, but. you're like kick a bleacher. You're like, I didn't need to do that. Yeah, and it's like hard. totally low key. There's no stakes. It's just pickup. No, with a bunch of uh, other faculty and sure, staff, sure. <laughs> a few students. So, so what you're saying is, in a way, basketball's uh, the club club sports is contributing something, but it's also reflecting something back to you. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I've been great. trying to master. Being calm, right? Yeah. In stressful situations, yeah. just in my personal life, and I've and I haven't done that, but yeah. I've gotten better at that. I've noticed that. Right. I talked to Professor McGrath about this, but the biggest challenge for me 
and remaining calm, especially in disagreements, was with my family. Mm. Like with my dad and my mom. Yeah. They would, you know, we'd have s- some disagreements and I'd push back normally, but mm-hmm. I'd find myself like just getting mad. Emotional about Emotional. It. It's not about the getting issues. Upset. Is, right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, where I wouldn't do that with my friends anymore, which is good because I used to do it with my friends. Yeah. So I do that less, yeah. um, less with my friends, if not at all, which is great. But when I got back on the basketball court, <laughs> it was like a reminder that it's not as easy when you're, right. you know, in the passions of a game and you're um, – trying to win and you're missing some open shots you want to hit. Like it gets, uh, yeah. so that being back to your question, I think that first of all, having the community of those, those guys yeah. has been great. Like I just said, it's been able to test me a little bit yeah. with these, uh, with my control, but it also gives me this kind of like invigorating ex- experience being back on the court. Mm, and, yeah. um, we traveled to, we played this school called Thomas Aquinas College, mm-hmm. and there was like 15 people in the crowd. Yeah, which isn't a lot, but they were all cheering right. the, for the other team, right. and that was awesome. It wasn't an empty gym. It yeah. was yeah. great. Yeah. Like, it was great. So, um, I had a I had a big second half or a big first half in that second game. Yeah, just hit a few threes in a row, just like talking to the crowd. It was so fun. Yeah. So that being part of that team and then being able to win and um, compete really has been special for yeah. me. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's great. Good year. Um, so yeah, I, I will look for some other maybe less competitive, stressful, <laughs> stressful things. But but um, and, and I have been going to. No, I shouldn't say I'm not involved. I am involved, but I have been going to Bible study. Nice, which yeah. I've really enjoyed. Good. Um, Scott runs that. I don't know if you know mm-hmm. Scott. Yeah, yeah, from campus ministry. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yes, yes, that's great. We really yeah, just talk about the the text, and yeah, I met some some good people there. So that's good. That's good. Um, what were your thoughts on when I asked you to come on my podcast? Like, did you? I was honored. Think about, really? Yeah, I was honored. Thank you. Thank I mean, you. listen, you know, when students sit down in your class and and you know start to listen to you talk at the beginning of a semester, they kind of have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> they uh, now, granted, they, they are they are indirectly slash directly contributing to your to your salary, but uh, and their parents are right, but. Um, they're a captive audience in a, in a way. They, they could drop, right? They mm-hmm. could always, they got to go somewhere eventually to take your class. Mm-hmm. And not everyone that's in your class wants to be in your class. And maybe even by the end of the 15 weeks, they, they're, they're happy to leave your class. They never wanted to, they never came around. Mm-hmm. So, to, so to have a student ask me to, to sort of have a conversation about, you know, a variety of questions uh, relevant to my scholarly and teaching, you know, life and, and interest and relevant to a whole range of other existential and personal questions is uh yeah it's an honor so cool. and i think of you as yeah. a as an exceptionally uh thoughtful and capable and personable student so all the more reason to, to be honored thank you that that means a ton yeah. i think that um you know a lot of people might say well why would you start a podcast you don't have any accreditations yet you don't really <laughs> have anything accomplished yet. and it is very uncommon there are maybe no, zero podcasts who just were started uh, i actually looked into it and there weren't many if at all mm-hmm. Anyone who started a podcast, just like a kid, just trying to start a podcast. But I, I think that my mission is good, and um, the mission is to is to search for truth and carry that search out with care, mm-hmm. like in love. Um, doesn't mean we don't disagree, and that doesn't mean we don't get passionate and fired yeah. up at times. But it means that after, like, we can return yeah. to that state of love. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I hope to turn it into this brand where I work on it, and I think that if it is to be a successful brand, it will take years. It might mm-hmm. take rebranding it might take whatever it will take but i think that this is a way to kind of jump like begin my further education after college yeah and then you know the goal is to continuously run into people like yourself Mm. um whether in school or in the world of business or wherever i'm working where i could say hey i have a podcast would you like to come on yeah you never know i mean someone could tell me something very wonderful that i can write about so i think that there will be a it's like a three-pronged approach, actually, where I want to post on social media, I want to post the podcast, and I also want to post blogs where I go mm-hmm. in depth on writing, yeah. right? Because I want to like formulate this, these ideas and mm-hmm. have them well thought out. Um, but I think that part of the reason I want to post on social media is because I want to combat this social media sphere that I see. And mm. I mean, I don't know if you saw this. I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal. It was. Um, Meta is getting sued. They're facing a lawsuit mm-hmm. for 
like possibly intentionally having meetings to figure out how they can really hook teenagers, yeah. what they enjoyed, like how these dopamine release wor- right. releases worked. Right, right, right. And of course, like TikTok and these other companies have had these meetings, I'm sure, as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess the lawsuit is still up in the air, but yeah. that seems like, well, I could just encourage people to to not go on social media, but I don't know if that's the answer, so I figured I'd... No, it's not going to go away, right? Right. 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 I, yeah. I mean, it's. I take it that your point there is that... Um, seeding that arena, seeding that domain, giving up that domain to those who have more or less proven that they want to commodify it and therefore, in a sense, influence, if not dominate other people for their own really financial gain, seeding right. uh, that ground to them isn't isn't necessarily the way to deal, to combat the problem, right. but rather to sort of re- try to redeem it, try to, try to be a force for genuine enrichment and edification is, is the better way to... Uh, Maybe go, and I, I think right. that's admirable. Great. Has it well, has it has it shaped? I mean, I don't want to be turn myself into the interviewer. No, but, I, I, I mean, love ha, you. To ask ha, how has great. if you can say, you know, has it shaped you? How in this period of time that you've been doing this, how has it shaped you to to have these conversations with a variety of different people? And one thing, it's it's definitely tested me because it can be embarrassing. It can be hard to tell someone who you know or don't know that you have a podcast mm. and. And that you know you haven't really earned the respect of having of, ha- of you haven't deserved any respect for it yet. Um, although I do think I I ought to deserve respect for it. Um, but at the same time, it's encouraged me to not care about what people think. Yeah. Because it's been a, it's been yeah. a practice of that. Right. Where right. I'm going to bring this up and I'm going to speak about it confidently and. Right. Right. If people don't like that, then I just I don't care. Well, right, and like you say, like like anything else, habituation is it takes practice, right? It's right. not. Yeah, I don't right. just become a confident person who. Who's who does what he thinks is right without mm. you know you actually have to try to do right. that especially in different contexts right you might be more confident on the court because so it's not it's not like a generic confidence problem it's confidence about that you have that specific right? thing right speaking right intelligently but and, confidence yeah. about your own curiosity and intellectual ability and ability to dialogue that right, right. you don't have as much confidence in and that's sure. where you have to work those different muscles that yeah 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 that's and great. I think that's another reason that I don't really care if, you know I get some negative <laughs> feedback from it because. I'm getting better at speaking. I'm getting better at listening. I'm getting better at asking questions. Right. Um, I hope to be an entrepreneur. So any, I think it's cool that I'm a philosophy major and that I'm hoping to be an entrepreneur because entrepreneurship seems to require <laughs> just um, understanding how humans operate and how we yeah. can work together productively mm. as like a big theme. But um, I have a few, I want to talk about social media again, actually, because I have a question sure. for you. Oh, but yeah. at, this, at the same time, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> but how do you deal with social media in your household? Right? You have a ton of kids. First of all, tell me about your household, like what it's like um, yeah. being a father to X amount of kids. Huh? Yep. So my wife and I have five children, ages uh, 20 months to 18 years, uh, spread throughout pretty much, pretty even, no, I would say evenly, but but across the different range, developmental ranges. Um, it's great. I mean, it's, um, I, you know, I... Um, I have three terminal degrees. I've written a monograph and multiple peer-reviewed articles. Wait, three reviews. terminal degrees. Which which uh, degrees? Bachelor's and master's and a PhD. Wow, yeah. Um, wow. I've traveled and given lectures. You know, I won't say around the world, but I've I've traveled. Um, I've studied at you know prestigious institutions. Um, none of that compares to the honor and the joy of being a dad, um, and being a husband. So. Um, and I'm proud of those. I mean, I, listen, I, I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my career for, you know, a lot of things. I don't know anyone's offering to trade me. <laughs> <laughs> There's not necessarily a standing offer out there. But what I'm saying is, I care a lot about what I do when I walk out the door. But when I walk back through the door, so to speak, prefer, you know, metaphorically, um, that's that's a that's a huge part of who I am, and it's a, it's a, it's an honor. Um, you know, my, I'm not sure my children would all <laughs> say they're honored to be. You know, they they, they, they they know my rough edges. They know my. Well, they might not say it now, but I think down the line. I, you know, what you've just as said, long as they know that I've I love them more than they can imagine, and that I've tried really hard to, and I continue to try hard to be a good dad. And um, so yeah, so that's that's a huge part of my life, um, being a father, being a husband. Um, social media, yeah, you know, we we've. Um, 
you know, I, I, I've no interest in, you know, talking about like my individual <laughs> yeah, yeah. children's like, you know, whatever they're there. I m- more can talk about their trauma of having to <laughs> right. have me say, what's your screen time today? Uh, you know, uh, are you, no, we're not, we're not, we're not downloading that app. But um, mm-hmm. no, I, I think I, I've tried to have um, similar kinds of conversations with my, with my, with my um, children as I have with my students when, when, when the time and the place is right. And it's not, it's not the same exact conversation, but just about how social media, like, like you kind of were saying with, with respect to your, the goals of your podcast, like many other things can be a force for good and a force for, for harm. I think it's just knowing the ways in which a particular domain or, or kind of media has particular uh possibilities and tendencies and, and likely you know likelihood of being harmful mm. and I think that's that's the real challenge is that the well there's many challenges but I think the very rapid proliferation I mean listen I when I was I mean I got my my first phone when I was 16 and it was a it was a handheld like a Nokia Kyocera like I had to pull the I'm that old right I mean I I am in this I had a flip position. phone I my, my, my generation I mean my generation is like it's I'm in this weird they they have a name for it but like I can remember when there was no internet and I know how to like really like you know okay. I worked IT so like I'm not like I'm not a computer whiz but like I've spanned the whole thing like I right, right. I was 12 and my parents got dial up you know what I mean okay. you know yeah going on like chat rooms and ICQ right, right. and AIM and all this stuff. So, so I've seen a lot of I've seen a rapid kind of. It's almost like when I've seen I, the whole thing. Well, it's, it's funny because cool. I had a friend whose whose grandmother for a lived lived a long time. So when I was in high school, she was she was born in like 1906 or something. Oh like. my! So here's goodness. a person right who's lived her whole life. She saw you know horses in carriage carriages, yeah. and when she died, the internet was a thing. You know. Oh my! And so on like on a much smaller scale, it's kind of like my generation, right? right. Um, we, we, and, and to some degree, even my parents' generation, my parents are young. So anyway, like to see that f- very rapid proliferation of social media, um, the the commodification of it, right? There's a way in which I think social media at this time and place, that the rapid development of it and the way that, uh, just broadly speaking, I don't, I don't mean to say this in a afraid way, but market forces have, have been allowed to commodify it and dominate it in ways that you're pointing out sure. with not a lot of transparency has created this kind of perfect storm where there's particular harms that are exacerbated, they're, 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 they're extreme. So I don't think that social media is irredeemable and I've tried, uh, my wife and I, I think have tried to maybe have a balanced position where it's it's not not in our, our children's lives, but it's it's certainly not in the part of their lives any sooner or any earlier than it needs to be. And that when it becomes a part of our their lives or we have open conversations about mm. its use and its abuse and, and its misuse. But um yeah, it's there's no I don't think there's a straightforward I, I don't I don't think that ultimately um well, I won't say that. Everyone has to figure out their approach to it. And there may be some people who have to completely cut themselves off from that and cut their kids off from that. Yeah. And I understand that. The flip side that, you know, I think individuals and families have to figure out is it's pretty hard to live a life completely without it. So how do you try to set yourself and others up for navigating it in a way that's not going to be completely harmful, but that might actually produce some good? I, yeah. I'll say this. Right. I have met um, – I've wasted some time on social media, probably probably Twitter more than anything. and. I've also met some cool people and had some interesting conversations. Right. I've also, yeah, had some ones that probably just went nowhere I shouldn't have wasted time. Sure. So it's mixed bag. Right. Interesting. I think, yeah, I mean, the harm is also hidden, which yeah. is bad. It's like hidden harm. And uh, I don't know. I, I think that we, we actually had a great discussion. Ben Kadamis organized a small meeting with yeah. a few students who were recommended, a few ma- male students. Yeah. And He's creating this thing called the men's round. Or he's creating this thing called the men's roundtable. But I think he's. Yeah. Um, it's going to be like next semester, open to all students. Right. Cool. Anyone can come. We can talk about just different topics in yeah. general. Um, and something I brought up was social media. Yeah. And that it's yeah. essentially like a drug. But, oh yeah. But it's not just a. It's not just like a drug in the sense that it gives you that dopamine hit when you're using it. Yeah. But it's like a drug in the sense that when you're not using it. You're almost subconsciously orienting your like actions towards this yeah, like it's shaping you it's shaping in an you. ongoing it's way. It's shaping you. Yeah. And you can't really know how it's shaping you and when yeah. it is and, and um sure, sure. How does how does 
faith impact your life maybe on a practical sense or maybe on a sense of in a sense of uh, Christianity mm. but how does faith impact your life and and why do you strive for it strive to have faith and to be faithful yeah um, I guess what yeah. is even striving for faith kind of yeah, look that's like that's a good question was that in the was that in the notes? I, I just have... wrote it down. <laughs> I should... Okay, because I'm like, I <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. You know, I made mental notes of some of the questions that you said you might want. to The, the first about. question I, I did say. No, no, was, this is good. This is good. Do, do you want to touch on the turning point? No, in your no, no. Okay, uh, yeah. we, however you want to roll. I think you can answer this. The striving one. Striving what, what for does it look faith. Like? Yeah. yeah. Well, take your time. Take your time. Uh, you and I recently read the better part of Fides et Ratio, faith and, on faith and reason. That's right. The encyclical by John, Saint John Paul II. Uh, uh, promulgated in 1998 and um, two of the images that we talked about I think in class um, and that's, they're, they're two of many images explanations conceptual kind of um, approaches to talking about the relationship between these modes of knowing in, in the encyclical two of them that we talked about where his uh, um, I always forget if it's an epigram or an epigraph um, I have no idea. I think an epigram is the beginning of a book. I think an epigraph is like on the tombstone, but I, I, I should know that. <laughs> Either way, the, the opening page before the, before the document even starts compares faith and reason to two wings of, of a bird, right? Right. Um, through which, I can't quote directly, through which, you know, the human mind, human soul, the human community, humanity searches, rises up in the search for truth, right? Truth in the, in the most transcendent and, and comprehensive and holistic sense, right? Not just particular truths, but truth as such in its, in its various iterations and, and uh, permutations. So that kind of symbiotic, you might even say synergistic relationship between faith and reason, I think is then invoked again a couple other times when he says that faith and reason contain, their modes of knowing that contain one another, and then later he says they are, they are, their relationship is like a circle. So if that circle, I mean, I think those are all of more of a, more or less of a piece. So if that circular kind of synergistic symbiotic way of thinking is right, then it doesn't suggest to me a, a strictly linear one-way street kind of relationship between the modes of knowing that, that commonly go by reason or understanding. I see some sort of logical or empirical or even aesthetic evidence um, and I and I conclude with more or less certitude that it's true versus I don't have a whole lot of evidence, but I'm going to infer slash trust slash believe. Um, it, it doesn't in, it doesn't imply to me that let's say on a what we might call classic Augustinian and Selmian fides querens intellectum. I believe, but I'm trying to get to understanding, which could imply I don't think it means for Augustine or Anselm. Once I get to understanding intellectus, I'm done. Neither does it entail, I'll, I'll believe once I fully understand, which I think is actually doesn't really make a whole lot of sense by itself anyway. Hmm. But it suggests that the interplay between believing, trusting, and trusting, being, and, and here's the thing maybe we could have talked about more this semester, but being faithful, having not just fides as an in, uh, epistemic action, I believe in this thing, but fides in, in the classical Roman Latin sense of trust and trustworthiness. I'm going to act, I I. I think this is true such in a way that it matters to my life. That is both the result of a certain amount of intellectus, insight, understanding, seeking for the, the data or the, or the pointers in that direction. It's as much as a result of that as it is a kind of catalyst for further understanding and vice versa. So to me, the striving comes from the fact that when I believe something not blindly, but when I believe something in an act of trust and an act of faithfulness, it perhaps is going to open up new avenues of insight and understanding for me, rational insight. And when I engage in greater, you know, further rational spe speculation and inquiry, it's going to require of me other further acts of, of faithfulness and trust. And that that cyclical relationship is never going to, that's the striving to me. So it's not like I'm striving to believe. I'm striving to believe, but I'm also believing in a way that I'm striving to understand and vice versa. And that's a kind of dialectical synergistic process that, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a lifelong journey, if not an eternal journey, depending on, right. you know, yeah, right. you, which, which eschatological, you know, vision of, of eternity you have. So. Right. Um, you mentioned that it has to be like, it starts with belief and then it gets to understand, right? What was that Latin? Fides querens intellectum. Okay, right. And then the opposite was... I can't believe until I fully understand. Is it sort of like or, that? Or, or even, you know, 
So there's two ways to, ways to do this, right? I, I think an unhealthily rationalistic way to be that way. I won't even believe until I understand. Yeah. I'm gonna turn. The, I'm gonna turn the one-way street around the other way, right. and I'm gonna turn all the signs and say, "No, we're not. We're not gonna get to belief until we have understanding." Which, again, could be a kind of contradiction in terms because yep. if faith and reason are two wings of the bird, of a bird, but they're still distinct modes of knowing, well, then perhaps what's definitional of faith is that is it is not fully intellectus yet, right? And vice versa. Okay, so either way you go, if there's a one-way street, it seems like. If it's only a one-way street, okay. both of them don't have something right, to right, right. What you're trying to do is change one into the other. And that's why I said it's a circle. I think so. <laughs> that's my uh, reading on the text. Right? And so a, a simplistic and I would think unhealthily rationalistic way of saying it would be, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm never going to arrive at tr and trusting myself to this claim until I have all the facts, until I have absolute certitude. Right? Yeah. But... And I think that that's problematic for a number of reasons. It's like a Descartes kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, you're going to get, get me to, wa yeah, gonna get me to wax, wax oh, uh, falsely eloquent on some figures that I don't have all the credentials to no. talk about. No, but I, listen, I, I think Descartes really complicated on this. I think he has a place in his system for there's a kind of mode of knowing, there's a kind of faith that it responds to a supernatural revelation that... Really, my, what he calls my puny powers of reasoning couldn't ever, right? right? I so I think he's serious about that. I think he thinks there are revealed truths. Does he think that every idea about God and the soul are subject to that kind of faith? No, because I think he thinks that in the meditations, um, the second and, and or fourth meditation, right? He thinks that you can treat this as a dis discrete um, uh, act of natural reasoning and, and, and purely philosophical inquiry without any revelation in faith. That's, that's how I read him. So, so perhaps that cordoning them off generates a kind of simplistic rationalism that, that I would want to avoid. But all that to say is that it, to me it doesn't work to say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just very neatly and in every, every case start with either with faith and hope I get to understanding or start with understanding and not allow myself to have faith until I understand it completely, until I have all the evidence. Either way, I think that JP2, John, St. John Paul II is saying, if the, if the bird's going to get off the ground, there's there's always going to be some, <laughs> there's going right. to be some interplay between these two. Perhaps in some sense from the from the very beginning, even if we don't even see just to get off the ground. I think so. Very nice. Huh. So 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 the answer to question about striving, I think the striving for faith <clears throat> is the is the striving to believe, and trust, and be faithful to in my actual life to the things um, that I've been asked to believe and do. Striving to understand them and, and do them, but also striving with my understanding to seek out the deeper truths that maybe my understanding can't fully comprehend, but that are really worth my assent and my under and my and my commitment of, of belief and, and action. Right, and and to go back to that circular point, yeah. it involves both of them. Yes, I think so. And, okay, right. That kind of. I guess I want to ask a question about my essay now. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, I have, it's an fine. I have an essay due for Professor Monroe in. 24 hours, a little bit, Sounds a little bit more, Sounds you know, right. 30, 30 hours, 36 hours, 36. Yeah. Um, and I, the question is, what is revelation, right? Broadly mm. speaking, challenging question to answer. Um, so you, you want me to give you the thesis for your paper? <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> or right my now. version of right your now. paper. Yeah. No, no, no. I, what, how would you approach it as a, as a vet that mm. you are, as okay. a seasoned vet you are? You're going to cite this podcast if you... <laughs> I, I actually, I <laughs> genuinely you, will. Like, I'll cite <laughs> Professor Monroe, uh, 11... Oh, gosh, that's that's yeah. that's a scary... That's a harrowing proposition for someone like me. Um, I'll tell, you what, so I, what I'll I tell think, you what I did first. Yeah, sure. I broke it down into the fact that I think that there are... Well, I haven't done it yet because I haven't finished the essay, but I think I'm, what I'm going to touch on is... I'm going to go in depth on is there are different levels of revelation and there are different types, and those different types require different levels of reason and faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is going to lead me to the conclusion that certain people have access to only certain types. Okay. But I am going to say that those types, they're not less value. They're not, um, I'm going to disagree with something I said in my last essay where like those other types of revelation that maybe someone who's not as intelligent can't figure out. Okay. They're not more valuable necessarily. Like they're not greater in worth. Okay. At least in the scope of that person who's intelligent versus that person who's mm -hmm. not intelligent. Like, mm -hmm. 
it's not more valuable to this person because they don't have an opportunity to even get it, mm -hmm. right? So I th that's my broad thesis. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's two things going on there, it seems to me, right? One is, <clears throat> what is the, <clears throat> what some of our authors that we read will call the external or the objective, <clears throat> the out there revelation. Yep. Scripture, <clears throat> natural revelation, the structure of the world as <clears throat> reflecting something of God's character, God's logos or rationality, whether it's <clears throat> logical, mathematical, um, physical logos, right? The structure of being on, on a sort of empirical level, um, moral logos, right? More, a, a structure to what's right and wrong, to what's human action. So there's natural and what, what like Aquinas would call special or divine revelation, natural being the structure of the world, already revealing something about God's being, God's character, God's truth. Um, special revelation in the classical sense being um, scripture, the life of Christ, the you know, the words of the prophets. And mm -hmm. and perhaps also you could you could you could argue there <clears throat> the work of the Holy Spirit in the individual life of a person. But saying that would also now entail us uh, requires to say something about the subject of or the or the right. the, the re receiving the the revelation to me. Right? And for Aquinas that's gonna be the gift of faith. Um, it's gonna be that the habit of that revelation is out there, it's external, but now it's, I accept it as true and it, and it impacts me, both in my intellect and will. Uh, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm kind of going off on no, the rabbit no, trail, but fine. to kind of connect it back to what you're saying, um, the value or the worth of different modes or kinds of revelation and then different externally, objectively, and then different subjective, personal, um, epistemic, or volitional appetitive, so my mind and my will and my desires and my emotions, different modes of apprehending and assenting to and responding to that, that's part of what makes the whole question really complicated, right? And and, and where truth is and, and how you access truth and how humans pursue it and dialogue about it, especially across, let's say, confessional, in a religiously pluralistic context, that and even, and listen, across lines of disagreement within Christianity, I mean, that's where um, this question of, it's not so much, I take you to be saying a question of truthfulness. So let's say, like Aquinas will say, is it okay to have implicit faith? Is it okay to not really know all of the speculative entailments of what, uh, of, of, that, that are bound up with what you say when you recite the creed at Mass on Sunday? Mm. He says, well, that has to be the case, yeah. that what he calls implicit faith um, is functionally worth kind of as much because not everyone who recites the creed on Sunday morning is going to read, let's say, his however many thousands of words of, of speculative treatment of the doctrine of the Trinity and his right. summa um, theologiae, his summa contra gentiles, his commentary on John, right? I haven't read it all. I've read all, quite a bit of it, but yeah. you, you know, the the person next to me at mass has not read any of it. Did they? Does the doctrine of the Trinity matter less to them than it does for me? It matters maybe differently, right? Right. Um, but in a, some way, there's a kind of equalizing feature to at least this Christian understanding of revelation that the core truth there informs both speculative and practical view of the world, whether or not one takes the what Aquinas will call the path of study, right? right? Versus relying on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of wisdom, and, the, and the, really the fundamentally the gift of faith. Right. Such that it impacts them. Yes, that other person, yes, on a kind of speculative the theoretical level. But it also moves their heart and, and their mind and their will to, to follow, you know, to love God, to right. know God. And, right. and as Aquinas says, to pursue that, that end that surpasses reason for which divine revelation was, was necessary. Well, one thing I left out in my essay was... Well, now that you say objective and subjective, right? These these different forms. Yeah, or you could say internal and right, and external okay, and yeah, internal, internal, yeah, external. Yeah. Right. However you want to put it, yeah. Um, doesn't there have to be, or is the thing that holds both of these together, the like maybe on the internal side, you have this trust for mm -hmm. purpose. You have trust that there's this intentional, that you're an inten intentional creation mm. with purpose. Yes, and then I think on that's the right. Yeah, external, that's it's like. Everything is is purposeful and with intent. Yeah, I, I think I know where you're going with this question, Gabe. Let let me riff on it for a second. Please do um, whatever. Because I actually think John Paul II's view of this um, 
his way of talking about it make uh, his way of talking about it is also his way of structuring the fides et ratio makes like a lot of sense of this. So the subjective act, a personal sort of internal epistemic and volitional act, meaning this act of intellectual apprehension. I, 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 I'm asked to believe these things and do these things. I, I see the truthfulness of it and volitionally, appetitively, my voluntas, my will wants to do it and I do it and I have a desire, you know, I have a desire to do it and then my will is moved to do it. Yep. That subjective act, it seems to me, is a fundamentally personal thing. I don't mean by that it's personal in the sense like, oh, I'm going to do it my way and you're going to do it your way. There, there's always going to be some of that just because no one's going to live exactly the same life and there, there could be different, you know, faithfulness can look different for me than it can look for you. Maybe sure. not in radically different ways, but in somewhat different ways. But when I say personal, I mean the act of a, of a, of an ontological entity known as a person. In the Greek, we call it a hypostasis. A somebody with an identity, with a story, Right, with, with an experience formed by the experiences and the other persons and relationships that, that have made them, made you who you are, made who I, me who I am, right? That's a very personal thing that requires personal agency. And I would argue such that this is what makes humans not the only thing capable of, of being connected to God, but uniquely capable of, of being made in the image and likeness of God and responding to God. Now, it seems to me you could sort of give an account of that act that is, uh, again, subjectively understanding epistemically what it means to believe and appetitively and volitionally deciding to do it, that it, it accounts for the, the personal, historical part of doing that in one story. And then think about the external revelation, the objective revelation that that person is supposed to believe and characterize all that as a, a, a court, sort of like a, like a list of ideas, like a, like a list of propositions. And I think what the Christian revelation in its best moments, and I think Fides et Ratio does do, is say, actually, humans are persons whose identity is bound up with what they do, what they've experienced, with their relationship with other people, precisely because they're made in the image and likeness of a divine creator, a God who is personal. Personal in at least two fundamental ways. A personal communion of three hypostases, three persons and one God, whose, whose eternal communion of love is not only the very source of their necessary and eternal being, but is also the source of the creation of everything else, of everything that exists that's not divine or yet divine. And personal because that same God went out and created persons, right, with, fr with free will, with, with being uh, formed by their own relationships with others, but who created personal agents in such a way that they could receive, not in exactly the same way, right, because the, 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 in, in eternity the Trinity doesn't, uh, you know, <laughs> struggle and stumble with, 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 with truth like we do, like we, we require this process of falling and scraping our knees and going yep, through yep. history and right but does seek to image its creator by personally receiving so so what does that mean well what it means to me is that the objective revelation of god is itself can it be codified in some sense in in propositions and a creed and a list of ideas yeah but it, it can't fully be captured and understood as a list right. of ideas. It's a, it is a person, and it is in fact three persons in the Trinity. And I think that's what John Paul II is trying to say when he says, listen, first of all, human persons are what they are because they seek to know, and they seek to know the truth, and they seek to find meaning in the world. Secondly, they are, their, their knowledge is personal because it fundamentally depends on their knowledge that they gain from other people so such that the whole project of human knowing has to depend on testimony, trust, belief, and therefore relationship. And ultimately, the highest form of knowing is the knowing of another person. So I, I get to know, like we talked about this in class, yeah, we did, right? I get to know something that you tell me happened. And in that process, I know more about that thing, but I also know more about you. But a deeper form of knowing, which we've engaged in somewhat up to this point in our relationship, is my knowing not about something else, some third-party thing, but knowing you from you. That's the deep, and anyone that's been in love or had a relationship right. knows, knowing somebody is way better than knowing about them.
So John Paul II says, that's already happening in the human process. We kind of know that the highest form of knowing is not even like abstract speculative philosophical or theological knowledge or, or even in the other sciences. Those things are all great. But right. The highest it's form of knowing other, is right? knowing another person. Yeah. And then he says, well, isn't it crazy then that when God decided to self-disclose, when the divine disclosed, he disclosed through Jesus as a person, right. a divine human person. Right. And it's not and I don't mean to, to say, show us the highest good maybe. to show us the highest good and to deliver what are necessarily propositions. Right. That there is ideas. Right? The, the ideas of Christianity are not they're not uh, unimportant. Like, I'll just get to know Jesus as, as a dude. You know, you'll be fine. No, you, they're, they're important ideas. But those ideas are most fully expressed in the life in and as the life of a, of a person who in communion with the persons of the Father and the Spirit reveal the deepest and highest truths to humanity in a personal way, historical, right. personal way. And, I mean, if you if you take Matthew 25 seriously and you take, I would argue, Christian ecclesiology and sacramentology, sacramental theology seriously, if even after Christ rises, dies and rises, dies, rises, and ascends, that is an ongoing interpersonal process through community. Mm. So to me, right, that right, subjective and objective right. Today. I mean, it's still going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's going on right now, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean not, not, I'm not really feeling We are yeah. seeking the truth together. Let's invoke the assumption buzzword. In the company of friends, yeah. right? That's a real thing because God is personal because in, in fact, truth is personal. Yeah. Now, in, and it's interpersonal. And you mentioned in this subjective act that our identity is bound up almost or we're yes. bound up in our identity and if God is personal in a similar sense could you say that he's bound up in goodness in love maybe yeah I think I think so and and, and in actively doing it right right not not just it's it's not God's goodness is not an abstract quantity it's abstract the, the concept of goodness is expressed concretely and particularly through <laughs> first the eternal act of love that generate uh, say, we say generates in, a, in an analogical way it's not like there was a moment when the trinity became the trinity is an eternal moment of mm. loving generation of the father generating you know beginning the the son and, 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 and breathing forth the spirit to use augustine and aquinas terms that's it it's an action it's an eternal mm. action that generates right. two co-equal persons and that goodness is then their love is what creates the world so this is another question i yeah. gave you which was i think a lot of people kind of get stuck on the the topic of transcendence and they think when they think about god and how so many evil things happen right mm. some horrible things yeah. happen and why would god create a world and rule essentially a world yeah where he allows these horrible horrible things to happen is it because he's bound just by goodness and he doesn't control evil or, or what, Say what or, you mean by being bound by goodness. Hmm. I don't know. I think. I'm I mean, it seems sure. to me you could say Actually. the two few ways to say that. Bound by goodness in such a way that God can only do good. God cannot commit or command evil. Right. That's right? right. And I would argue, I would affirm, yes, that's that's true of God. When we say can't, there about God, it's a backwards way, way of saying God is ultimately in um, in. Um, Un, uh, infallibly capable of resisting evil, right? Mm -hmm. The other way to say it is, okay. is God's being bound by goodness mean somehow, and I'm not sure how this would work, but it, it seemed implied in the way you phrase it, makes God unable to overcome evil or, 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 or prevent all evil. Mm. So, so did you mean both of those or one of those or a combination? Or? Well, I think about, I guess what I mean is that God, and I got this, I learned this from Jordan Peterson, although I think I could have learned it myself, but um, he said that God allows the potential for evil in the world and not evil in and of mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. So when when I think that, when I see God allowing the potential for evil into mm -hmm. the world, I see that as an act of goodness because it allows, it gives us an opportunity to actually be good ourselves. Sure, yeah. So we can see the evil that's that's uh, m manifesting itself yeah. potentially, but then we say no. Yeah. And then we we are good. Yeah. Of that. No, I mean I, I I don't I don't really fundamentally disagree with that. I think I think that you know there's a lot in the details there, but that that's more or less the standard. I would argue the standard ancient and medieval Christian account of God's permission of evil, not entailing God's direct willing of evil. I mean I, I mm. I've come at this point to take 
as many of my cues as, as I can take from St. Gregory of Nyssa on this and in his various places where he talks about this, but the catechetical oration is, is the most, I think, the most succinct, um, where he's clear that um, there, there's no, God does not directly will any particular evil. I mean, he couldn't, right? Yeah. To, to be, to, right. and be good, and be and good, be at good least on, on, on my understanding. Of it. There, there are Christian theologians in the archive who say, no, God can, can command and do whatever he wants. That's, in, in, in essence, divine power, you know, overcomes trumps, you know, is the overcard to goodness. Goodness has to be subordinated to power. I, I, don't, I don't think that way. So Nissen says, um, yeah, God does not directly will, and yet God does want to create a creation which mirrors him in its ability to be free. Right, the the pro the problem or the obstacle is God's freedom for because of the commitment to the good, right? Bounded by goodness in the positive sense. God's freedom always results in God doing the good. Human freedom has the potential to go either way. It's creaturely freedom, and the and the and the risk or the divine sort of it's not a gamble. It's not like God doesn't know, but the divine wager you might say is that it's worth creating a world where. And this would argue, at least temporarily, along the way, that possibility for evil will, will be realized as evil, mm -hmm. but not in a way that will be um, irredeemable for God. Right. So, yeah. Thank you for your insight on that. That was wonderful. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, um, I'm just I, riffing I, well, on <laughs> smarter than smarter. <laughs> Come on, get out of here. Um, we'll shift gears here, though, because sure. I have a few more questions I do want to get to before we yeah. wrap this up. Um, I've come to really enjoy the liberal arts education here. Mm. Um, Robert George. Robert George? Yeah, Robert George. He said, uh, the purpose of a liberal arts education is to lead an examined life. Mm. And then uh, Cornell West, this is a discussion they had. He yeah, follows up those, says, those are great videos, yeah. Great videos. And he says that the purpose of a liberal arts education is to learn how to die. Mm. And um, I was at UNH <laughs> I was at UNH visiting my friend yeah. this weekend. I was talking to uh, one, one of his buddies. We were at like a party. And we were talking about what we're doing for education, right? Mm -hmm. He's, UNH is very much not a liberal arts right. school, right? Yeah, so, yeah, I imagine um, so. And I, I've never told anyone this. Usually I, I go to the Robert George uh, quote, right, to yeah. tell people what I think about liberal arts education. But for some reason I was talking to this kid. I was like, yeah, I'm actually gonna, I'm trying to learn how to die. And he, was like, <laughs> he looked at me like <laughs> I was genuinely a psycho. Yeah. Like he really looked at me like I was crazy. Because yeah. um, I think, and that's a normal response. Like maybe yeah. I'd do the same if I was him. Um, so why is getting an education in the liberal arts not as popular as it, I feel like it should be? people don't want to admit they're going to die. <laughs> uh, Cornell West, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah right. um, wow. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being partly funny, but I think, I think there's truth to that. Um, so they're both, yeah. they're both riffing on the Platonic dialogues, right, in their own way. Um, uh, Socrates says in Plato's version of his last statement, right, in the Apology, um, far be it, you know, I would quote directly, but uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. In mm. so many words, right? right, right, right. Uh, in, in other words, to say, uh, I think, I read him saying, if I, if I do and say what you want me to say in order to save my life physically, I'm going to die on the inside anyway, right? And, right. and I, the, the life right. that I would go on living, having, um, having sort of copped to um, the Miletus and the, 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 the charges being raised against him would mean he'd just live a life that was no longer true to his principles. Mm. And, oh man, I'm uh. going to make myself look. I, I think the uh, preparation for death quote is from the Phaedo. Um, and he says, the life, of, the life of philosophy, which remember in the Greek is just love of wisdom, right? The pursuit, the, the pursuit of wisdom because one, one wants to love it. They would, most of the philosophers in well, the philosophers in that tradition would say, you know, you don't want to say you're a sage because you, you, you're actually, you're still seeking the truth. You're, you're mm -hmm. trying to become wise. You're not yet wise. Right. Um, so love of wisdom is a love of something I'm trying to go after. I, I'm not there yet. But he says, yeah, it's, it's, it is. They're mad that he's, his friends are mad that he's, he's chosen Going to, to die. die yeah, right? Right. And, and, and Maybe in the credo, actually, then. Cause he, credo yeah, it might be, and it might be in both. But um, yeah. right. they're mad that he's not going to get himself, well, he could just say the thing and get himself off. He says, mm -hmm. that's what I've been prepping for my whole life. So I think, so, t yeah, sorry, right. to back to your question. No, no, no. Um, you know, we, I talked to my first years this year because we, we read a really difficult and I think really, really fruitful um, novel at the end of my um, 
introduction to theology class called Silence about Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century who, um, alongside um, Japanese Christians, are martyred or they're they're threatened with martyrdom, uh, losing their life for their faith. But we had this, you know, we we have these great conversations. I had a particularly good one this fall with students about giving up your your physical life for something, principles for another person, whatever. Um, so we talked at length about that, and I think. You know, some people it's intuitive that yeah, you you would you would give your life for someone else or for something else, right? I think that the liberal arts, um, I don't think it's too dramatic to say that that they are preparation for death in the sense that they, in their best moments, study of the liberal arts habituate you to think about reality. In the sense of thinking about what's ultimately most meaningful to you, what's enduringly true. And the habits of, of, of thought and practice that will allow you to do that for the rest of your life. Right. The seeking for those kinds of truths is or could be the seeking for the kinds of truths that you would either die for if you had to or at the very least lead you to think about the value and the meaning and purpose of your life beyond whatever right, length right. of physical years that you have on this And earth. if you sacrifice that process or sacrifice any progress you've made in understanding those truths, you're really, I mean, you're losing your soul. You're basically selling your soul. And I think that this happens a lot, uh, especially with younger people, because mm. we want to have friends. We want to fit in, right? Mm. But if we sacrifice, if we don't, if we're not real with our friends and, mm -hmm. we, and we don't say stand on what we believe, yeah. right, with them, then we, m we might lose some friends if, if we uh, tell them what we believe. But you also, if you don't tell them what you believe, you might lose yourself. And then it's like a question of, yeah. Which kind of, I mean, you want to have friends that can be with you in your beliefs and your understandings, uh, in those like truths, or maybe sure. just the mission, I guess. Sure. No, I think I think that's fair, Gabe. Here's my concern. Um, so what I articulated, um, one conclusion, and um, articulates too strong. What I stumbled over trying to explain um, could lead to a, a variety of different explanations about popularity or or willingness, desire, eagerness to study the liberal arts, right? So it sounds to me like your analysis leads to this notion that, hey, there's just not a lot of people who want or see the value in studying stuff that's worth dying for, right? Or studying stuff that will transcend uh, a given particular moment in their personal life, moment in the culture, moment That's the view in, I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a slightly more optimistic view. Not because I don't think that there's a segment of, of – our population more generally in our segment of our student young population of young people who really with faced with the opportunity would say yeah no I, I don't want to do that I actually think it's more on us as as liberal arts educators and us as you know on our society that well C.S. Lewis's uh, you know statement about Christianity right it's not it's not a path that's um, been found wanting and and uh, that's been tried and found wanting. It's a path that's, you know, um, sorry, that's, that's, it's not a path that's been uh, tried and found wanting. It's a path that's been pre preemptively found wanting and not tried, right? And I think for many people, oh, that's very interesting. right? For many people, yeah. it's in fact the lack of exposure to the disciplines, the texts, the ideas, the figures, the questions, the, 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 the activities of reading, discussing, debating, thinking, mm. having someone change your mind, having standing up for your principles. It's it's actually the lack of exposure to uh. those things for a variety of reasons. It, there's not a lot of liberal arts education being done at the high school level. And to some degree, you know, I'm not I'm not faulting high school educators. There's only so much you can do when you're trying right, to get people so to like you just like know the school. know the things, right? Yeah, right, right. So that there's a lack sense. of exposure. And then many colleges and universities have gone a different direction, doubled down on articulating, constructing their education and marketing it and articulating it as professional training and training for how to get a career and make money, mm. right? So where, tell me where and when, aside from great YouTube videos from yeah. Cornell West and Robbie George that are long and many, you know, 17, 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds don't spend time to watch or read from, how are students even being given the opportunity to see if they even want a kind of education which is not 
uh, it, it, it is not like here at Assumption. It's not to the expense of training for a career, yep, professional yep. education, figuring out how to, they're, they're going to make a living, which is absolutely important, right? People have to learn, you know, how to make money and how to have a living. So it's not absent that, but that actually highlights and says this is the thing we value. How many people have been exposed to that? Mm -hmm. And let me put another spin on it, if it's okay. In what ways has our current socioeconomic system made it even tougher for a large number of students to even know that that might be available and actually to have it available to them? Right. So I, I think there's there's access and, and accessibility questions. Yeah, of course there are some people who want no part of it, but I... I I think that if we were able to make the case for its intrinsic value and make it more accessible to people, I actually think it's probably more compelling than you give it, you know, that right. people will be compelled more, maybe more frequently than we might think. Well, it's harder to sell an education that teaches you how to die versus an education that gets you into the best accounting job or the best sure. business job. Sure. Right. And I think, so I think we're actually in agreement that I was just pointing out it exists, right? The, yeah. the, the fact that students are not necessarily interested in these enduring questions yeah. and search for meaning. I think that exists. And I think you think it exists too, but you explained why, which was a lack of expo lack of exposure. In part. Not in, part. Not in total. But, but in I part. think but I think that is the most important part that is problematic. Like yeah. I don't think these what bothers me is I know these people are not incapable of it. Right. They are capable right. of it. But they don't want to hear it from me. Right? Because <laughs> I'm still I'm just I'm on the same level as them. Yeah. And I, and I feel I, I almost just feel I almost feel as though I don't have the right to even elaborate these points to them because mm. I'm just learning them myself. Yeah. And there's a time and a place, and I've found some great, I've had some wonderful conversations with friends who are interested, and, and they love that I'm learning about these different things, and I've enjoyed telling them these things because it helps me understand them better. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we're mostly in agreement besides um, the, or no, I think we're mostly in agreement. Lack of exposure, I think, is the main problem. Mm, okay, yeah, no, yeah. I think I think that that's right, and... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. There's no simple fix to it. Um, I'm, I'm proud to teach an institution that at least has a a, a commit, a, you know, sort of a it's a inbuilt commitment with a with a, a foundations program, a kind of a core curriculum that that tries to expose students to that in a meaningful way. Um, and and I have many colleagues who are, as you well know, because you've studied it under many of them, oh, yeah. even more capable, much. more All right, so we got cut out. I don't know what we I lost. I know. There. Yeah, I don't know what we lost. We had a great. To... <laughs> yeah. We had a great discussion about liberal arts and um, are we, what it are means. Are we rolling again? We're rolling again. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, no, no, you're good. You're good. Um, so I want to ask you one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Sure. So my last question. Water yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is that? You got that's your like gallon this jug. This right uh, I think it's a half gallon. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Word. Word. What is your advice to young men? Cultivate friendship. Yeah. Yeah, I I, um, I think that a lot of the challenges that really young men and young women face, but perhaps maybe even more so the challenges that um, young men face in contemporary society um, are exacerbated by um, the, the lack of I don't want to say lack of ability, but I think we we struggle to teach young guys how to make friends and be friends. Now, of mm, course, we're, we have right. to talk about kinds of friendship, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which are what? What are the three kinds? I don't know the three kinds. Aristotle? Yeah, Aristotle's... I, is it ethics? I've never read the ethics. I th uh, yes, I think it's Nic Nicomachean ethics, but utility... Uh, oh, sorry, f uh, friendships of utility, friendships of pleasure, and friendships in the good. Mm. You know, friendship like, you know, we're friends because... I got a car on campus and you don't, and you know we're friends. Yeah, friends. and it's not like you're just using me, but in a way, it's kind of like, like we're in class together. I yeah, help you here, you help me there. Let's be whatever. honest, we'd be acquaintances, but if if I didn't have a car, we might be acquaintances, but we wouldn't really be friends, right? Interesting. Friendship of pleasure. We genuinely enjoy other things together, and maybe even enjoy being together. Right. So that there's a real there's. Something real, excuse me, something more substantive, genuinely more substantive than just you need me for something, mm -hmm. right? You want to be with me even if I can't give you something other than just the pleasure of being together and doing stuff together. Common interest, we like Celtics, right? Sure. We like each other. Friendship in the good, which I think Aristotle thinks is very rare, but I think my, my, my take on this is that uh, a lot of friendships are sort of like midway between pleasure and, pleasure and the good, good, right? Yeah, There's a mixture, right? right? right. 
But friendships in the good are friendships based on our common pursuit of virtue. We have we have similar goals, similar values. Or- yeah, we. I mean, you think about it the way I maybe would want to think about it this way. Th- this means we wouldn't just do fun things together. We would suffer together. No, I would suffer for and with you and you with me because we see this. there's this higher goal. It's becoming the kind of person we're supposed to be. Hmm. So why do I think that that's important? Well, one thing is, is that, as Aristotle also says, humans are innately social animals, right? Um, we're rational animals. We're social animals. Therefore, like political animals or whatever. But... To be human, to some degree, you have to have relationships. To be fully human, you have to have relationships. And to be to flourish, you have to have those kind of relationships that, that approach <laughs> something right. like friendship in the good. So that's just true in general. I think it's especially true or especially needful and especially um, lacking when we think about the ways in which genuine friendship where you can be vulnerable with some because of a friendship in the good I, I, I trust you I, I'm, I'm willing to be vulnerable with you you're willing and I'm willing you're willing to tell me and I'm willing to tell you hard truths when you need to hear it when I need to hear it that's really lacking and it it only ex, it only makes worse it only exacerbates the problems created by very shallow relationships hmm. uh, and, and I, I again I think Everyone is susceptible to this. I do think that going back to the social media thing um, and other forms of media, I think that perhaps maybe young men in our in our day and age are, are even more um, susceptible to it for, in unique or or if not more uniquely susceptible to it. Right. If you can't find a meaningful relationship, you'd rather have a um, you'd rather have a shallow relationship, really than shallow none at all. I mean, right? Yeah. Well, there's that, right? And if you don't think, I mean, if you if you think that having a meaningful friendship in the good is like not a thing that guys do <laughs> what's first of all what's that going to do for you more generally how's that going to keep you from from living a kind of flourishing life and then secondly when it comes time if it comes time for you to want to commit your life to another person the only way that that kind of relationship is going to last if it's it is if it's fundamentally friendship Right, if they're your best it's friend, right? Exactly, or something approaching a, a, a kind of best friend. I mean, I, I think you know, for me and my wife, even a more special. Yeah, friend. we're we're yeah. best friends in a way that even you know, it's it's not just different. I mean, it's it's categorically different, but it is it is ultimately friendship. And I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of suffering that 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 contemporary people go through, maybe especially young people, um, because we don't know how to be friends. Um, and, and that and that carries into, let's say, marriages and things like that. But um, it also, I think, contributes to, yeah, a, a proliferation of damaging forms of shallow relationship that friendship with other, with other let's say for guys, friendship with other guys, genuine friendship could, could help curb or help ameliorate, help fix, help prevent, um, but also could, could allow everyone really to flourish in more long-term relationships in a way that yeah that's that's more genuine so that wow yeah. cultivate friendship true friendship if you can true friendship right that, that means that's a wonderful answer i think well i mean it, it mean it means being lucky enough to find people who want to be genuine who know or who are willing to learn with you how to become a real friend and it and it requires that kind of you know it's kind of like we, i don't know if we got the whole conversation there but about liberal arts and the sort of the courage right to pursue something that's not immediately gratifying a true friendship is, is not immediately gratifying. A true friendship, like mm. a marriage or something else, like having kids, like like getting a degree or becoming a master of a particular trade, it it, it entails work, hard work, persistence, suffering. So yeah, in, you know, in that way, friendship's a school, right, right. Of for life. You don't want an effortless friendship. You actually want a friendship that takes effort and, and oh, resources, yeah. right? Yeah, an effortless, an, effortless, an effortless friendship, it might be at best a friendship of, of utility, right? Because when it becomes hard, it's no longer useful to you, so you cast it away. Right. Whereas a friendship in the good, if you can reach something approaching that, friendship ordered to virtue, by definition, withstands suffering, co-suffering, disagreement, pleasure, right? right. Fun, joy, but pain and... Wow, yeah. So that would be, and, and I don't say that as an expert friend, but I do say that as someone who's had the profound privilege of having some real friends. Who are some genuine, real friends, yeah, some right. Some real right. friends. Um, wow. Yeah, 
to whatever extent I've succeeded in life, it's definitely been been on account of friendship, in at least in part, if not in large part. Wow, very nice. That's uh, encouraging. Thank you for sharing these ideas. I think this is a good place to to stop. Um, I thought you touched on so many great different things today. I think we all have a lot to learn from, like theology in general, different theologians, but also yourself. I think that um, I just appreciate the time you took to talk to a student, right? Maybe some professors wouldn't take this time, so it means a ton, and I, uh, I thank you for supporting me on this journey of well, this podcast. Yeah, I appreciate that, Gabe. I, as I said at the beginning, I'm honored. Um, it's a joy for me to do this. Um, you know, I think uh, that you came to my office before the second paper, and I think we, we, we jammed for maybe an hour or so right, on, sure. on Veroes and Maimonides. Yeah, yeah. Aquinas. I don't know, a few people, maybe Calvin, I don't know who we talked about that day, but I remember mm-hmm. when you left that day, I thought, well, Sometimes being a, a professor, a university professor, can be a drag. It, it is a dream career for me, but there yeah. are days in which there are enough emails that come through my inbox right, right. that, that are, seem to me very low importance, right? But days, you left the, the, off, the office that day, office hours that day, and I thought, oh, well, that's one of the reasons I'm here. Let's go. Do that's that, awesome. Right? And, th- and, th- and this is an extension of that. So it's an honor. And as a person who thinks that I'm still very much in process, I'm, I'm, I'm still along the way. I've figured a few things out, but I've still got a lot of growing to do. This is enriching for me too. So thank you. For that means a lot. Time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate Let's it. Let's go. Go Celtics. It's a wrap. Go Celtics. <laughs>